world war. So we as Christians, though, we know who's in control. There's no reason for us to fear. We know that God is in control, and he's still sitting on a throne. This is not taking him by surprise. And we know that Israel's not going to be destroyed. We see where Israel is in end times. <clears throat> but there's going to be a lot of things that, that happen. And we don't know all the details, but we do know the most important detail. We win. <laughs> we are on the right side. You know, we, we just have to continue on serving the Lord. Because we, we know that we have ultimate victory in the end. But there's going to be some times where it may not look that way. But if you ever get discouraged, just read the last chapter. You know, if you've ever um, were a New England Patriots fan, which I'm not, you know, that's a team, one of my top teams to despise. <laughs> because they always beat us. When I say us, I'm part owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but don't um, tell me anything about football because we block out football of our mind and conversations on Sunday because we focus on the Lord and then not football. Football is just really insignificant. Plus, we don't all know the scores. But if you ever watched that once, which I, I did not like the Super Bowl at all, but when New England was losing by three, three scores against, what was it, Atlanta? Or is it, no, the what, what team was it? They were losing by three scores. And if you ever watched that in a, a, as a rerun, if you're a New England fan, if you didn't know the end of it, you'd be stressing. But if you already know that they win the game, you could be watching that game, even though you're down three scores, and it looked, and especially when what's-his-name caught the ball on the 20-yard line, all they got to do is kick a field goal, and is, there's no way they could mathematically win the game but then they tried to go they started to try to pass the ball and then they got penalties sacked and then they had a punt and then but when he catches the ball and made a first down game over game over you wouldn't be stressing if you're a new england patriots fan because you know the end result you know they won you're gonna be laughing you, you're gonna you're gonna be feeling good because you know the end result you're on the winning team they won the super bowl it's kind of like that with us. That's a bad illustration, but we already know who won because we got the last chapter there. We know that the devil gets thrown into the lake of fire along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. We know that we as believers are going to be in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity. He comes back for us. We're going to be with him forever. So we should be pretty confident. We have, there's no reason for us to, to fear. But what we need to do is we need to fear Him. If you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. If you don't fear God, you've got to fear everything else. It's, it's um, infinite, the things to fear, if you don't fear God. And then what we need to do is we need to get the gospel out to those who are in fear to let them know once you receive Jesus Christ, now you won't have anything to fear. And we have what they're looking for. We have the answers. They're looking for what we have. All we have to do is tell them and market it correctly. What I mean by that is we should have joy ourselves. We should have love, joy, and peace in our life. We should love others, right? We should have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And we should have pe the peace that passes all understanding. If we're stressing out, then what are we displaying to them? If we can't get along, what are we displaying to them? And so we market it correctly because Jesus lives within us. And then we let them know. And when they receive Jesus Christ, then they will know what we know. And that's the Prince of Peace. There's not going to be any peace in the Middle East until the Prince of Peace rules and reigns. And we'll rule and reign with him. So I just wanted to share that before we get into Colossians. 
So now that that's done, and I'll try to keep updating things as, as um, the war continues. This is a very, very important time we live in. But like I said, the most important thing for us is to get the gospel message out. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, just like Ephesians, Colossians is a prison epistle. It's a book that Paul wrote while he's in prison, along with uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, Colossians. So Apostle Paul, who was in prison, took he made the most of his time there, and he writes this epistle, the book of Colossians. Now Colossians, if you read Colossians and Ephesians, they're very similar in a lot of ways. And he might have wrote them, you know, kind of close together. There's some similarities, but there's also a good amount of differences too. Whereas Ephesians shows that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. In Colossians, uh, uh, Paul is describing Jesus as he's the head of all things. That in all things that he might have the preeminence. And in Ephesians, where Paul is not necessarily dealing with an issue, he is in Colossians. So there's this guy named Epaphras. And Epaphras was with Apostle Paul when Apostle Paul was in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was 100 miles, or Colossians, I'd say, was located about 100 miles east of Ephesus. That's where the city of Colossae was located. And Apostle Paul spent three years. In fact, it was the most time he spent in one place. And he spent three years in Ephesus. While he was in Ephesus, if you remember, he taught in, the, in a school, the school of Tyrannus. And when he was teaching in this school, you had people that would come in here and hear him teach. And the, one of the people that came to hear him teach was a, a, was a person named Epaphras. So Epaphras got saved under the ministry of Apostle Paul. And then he's the one that goes to Colossae and starts this church. And he becomes, of course, the founding pastor of the church at Colossae. So this guy, Epaphras, was the founder of the church. And Apostle Paul, well, he wasn't the founder directly. But he was through the fact that he ended up reaching Epaphras, who founded the church. Not only that, but Apostle Paul never did go to the city of Colossae. At the time he wrote this, he never went, and he didn't even, after this, I don't, I'm pretty sure he never went to the city of Colossae. But when he was in prison, this guy, Epaphras, came to visit him. And when he came to visit Paul, he's letting him know about some of the problems in the church. So you figure that, here's Apostle Paul in, pris in prison, and this guy comes because he got a problem. <laughs> and so he tells Apostle Paul that there's some problems in the church. So he writes this epistle to address the problems in the church at Colossae. Now, the church at Colossae was in the church was, was prominently made up of Gentiles. It was a Gentile church. And so in this, in this uh, church was affected by a lot of things that go on, that went on in the culture, you know, of Colossae, which is, you know, something that normally, naturally would happen, just like anywhere else. I mean, if you're in a city that is a very immoral city, then some of that is going to affect the church because... You know, if someone, let's say if someone is uh, an alcoholic and then they get saved, you know that, if, uh, I believe that, and sometimes, and I've heard about this, and I'm sure you could attest to this, that when you get saved, that the Lord takes a lot of times some of the things that you were involved with, he just takes them from you. And, you, and there are people, this is how it was for me, that I was heavenly, uh, hev heavily involved with uh, alcohol before I got saved and probably would have been, I mean, could, could have took me down all the way down to the ground like it does a lot of people, alcohol. 
That's how it was with me. But when I got saved, he took that from me. I didn't even have the desire. He just took it from me. No, but that's not everything in my life. And then there are some people that were alcoholics that after they get saved still struggle. It's still a struggle for them. It's just we don't, everything is, it's different for everybody. And so alcohol was never an issue with me after I had gotten saved. It just a desire was gone. And, but then yet, if there's people that struggle with alcohol, and in some, sometimes some individuals in some situations in our life, we, we still struggle with it. We wrestle with it, something we really have a difficult time with. So when uh, someone like that backslides, what do they do? They, they, they get drunk when they backslide. So if you have a church that is, has a lot of people like that from the community, it can affect the church. And that's what was happening in this church. Now, there were some beliefs in Colossae, in the, in the community, and some of the things that affected the community that, came, that crept into the church. You had those that were the Gnostics. And they believed that God created, the, uh, um, he's, he created everything spiritual, but everything material was, is sinful. And so he created all of these other beings, and there was one of the particular beings that was far from God that is the one that created the physical universe. It was a kind of just a weird, and they, they believe that Jesus himself wasn't even really a physical being. And when he would walk, he wouldn't leave footprints in the sand. And they had some, just some weird uh, beliefs about things. And these that were uh, the Gnostics, and these that were the mystics. So you had some of this in the community that crept into the church. So there was some type of belief in, Col- in, in Colossae, in the church of, that Paul is writing this letter to, that we don't know exactly what it was that they believed, but some people call it the, the uh, Colossian heresy. And it was, seemed like a mixture of three elements. One of the elements would be Jewish legalism. And that's what Paul had to deal with a lot of times, which the legalists, they believe that as a Christian, you still had to follow the law. And they believed in order to become a Christian, you had to become a Jew which means you had to be circumcised. And so those were the legal, legalists, legal law, so they still followed the law. And they didn't like what Apostle Paul preached. They felt like Apostle Paul was running down the, the law. Jesus himself said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. The law is happy in that now we are made righteous in Christ. The law just wanted us to be righteous. I mean, if the law was a person, and we could not, we could not be righteous by following the law. Because we, no one has. But we are righteous through the substitute of Jesus Christ. So the law is happy because we're righteous. But legalism basically goes back to the law in saying that you have to keep the law. And it's those that are legalistic are very normally unhappy people. They're looking at other people as you don't keep the, the, the strict rules that we keep. It's the Pharisees. The Pharisees were legalists. And it's, uh, they have a lot of pride because I, I, we keep the law and you don't. So you have Jewish legalism. That was part of it. Then another part of the, the heresy was Gnostic mysticism. That was m- mixed in with that Jewish legalism. And then another thing about it was religious asceticism. And uh, uh, that, those that believed in asceticism it's a word I have a hard time pronouncing, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but they believe that we had uh, that you had to live a strict life, dieting and abusing your flesh. You know, like um, those that were the ascetics, they would fast for long periods of time, or they would, you know, meditate all day, or they'd do certain things, and, and they felt like by uh, abusing themselves. I mean, there were some that took it to an extreme that would even pluck their eyes out, you know. So they wouldn't, like when the Bible says that, they took it literally, you know, pluck your eyes out, cut your hand off, whatever, so that you don't, you know, lust or whatever. And there were some that, were, that did that to the extreme, but they would abuse themselves in thinking that that impressed God. By the way, it doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't impress God. So you had the 
uh, religious ascetics, you had the uh, uh, Gnostic mysticism, and you had the Jewish mysticism, and it was kind of mixed together, and that was the Colossian heresy. So that's what infiltrated the church. And so what P Apostle Paul does, basically, in the book of Colossians, is he's trying to, and this is the, the overall thought of Colossians, that all you need is Jesus, <laughs> And Jesus is all you need. And if all you have is Jesus, then you have all that you need. Everything is in Christ. In all things that he might have the preeminence. And so everything is about Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. It's not about the law. It's not about this Gnostic, mystic belief. It's not about abusing your, your flesh. You ever see those, those people that they have... Um, I think in the Philippines every year you have some people that crucify themselves. They walk down, they whip it, and then they go on a cross and they'll even have their hands nailed and they'll be on the cross and they do that. And some people do that. I mean, not to the degree that Jesus was crucified, obviously, but in that there are, you know, as Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Well, they took it, you know, as if Jesus, as if God up in heaven is impressed with that. He is not. He is only impressed with Jesus Christ. And so we need to live the Christian life through the power of Jesus. We need to have a relationship with Jesus and try to be like Jesus. And, and in doing that, the power of Jesus will help us to live the Christian life. And that's what pleases the Lord, is his son. So Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians, is that's basically what he's going to be doing letting people know that it's all about Jesus Christ <laughs> it's not about how much you know it's not about how much you can abuse yourself or how strict you live or how much how many keep all about Jesus Christ so the overview of the book each chapter it goes kind of like this you see his he writes to them on a personal level in chapter one then he gets into doctrine in chapter 2. Then you have the practical application in chapter 3. And then you have the relational part of the book in chapter 4. And that's how the book is written. Personal, doctrinal, practical, relational. And a lot of Paul's books, he'll do that. He'll, he'll talk doctrinal first and then practical after that. And that's important because, and sometimes people make light of teaching where they'll think, you know what, I don't want to go to church and just be bombarded with facts and teaching. We just want to sing, you know. We just want to, I don't know, we just, we just want to have a good time. Well, you know, one of the things that we see in the church at Antioch is that Apostle Paul and, and Barnabas, when they assembled, when the people assembled together, they taught the people for a solid year. I mean, it was very important for them to teach the Word of God. And I think, honestly, I think that learning is enjoyable. I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, a, I think it's fun. It's enjoyable. But not only that, because the Bible says that we're supposed to grow in grace and in what? And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's how we get to know him. We got to know his word. Just like in any relationship, you're going to get close to somebody, you got to no get to know them. You got to talk with them. And so that's what, when we come to church, that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we do a lot of teaching, because teaching is important. And someone might say, well, we need to, we need to be, Living right is the most important thing, and that's, that, that's true. But how are you going to know what is living right if you don't know what right is? So you have to know what the Bible says in order for us to apply it and then to teach it and to proclaim it. So Apostle Paul is teaching them that, the doctrine. So for the first chapter we're going to see is Apostle Paul is uh, his introductory remarks and uh, his personal approach the relationship that he has with the church. So we'll begin there and we'll see how, how far we get. Wow, it's really 
clock is fast, I'm sure. Yeah, it's probably really fast. So introduction. Well, I'll give you the points at least. <laughs> and then we'll next week, but we'll get started. The introduction, verses 1 and 2. Then we see intercession. Paul prays. This is very convicting, <laughs> just this part. Verses 3 through We'll probably just get to this part today. Then we see inheritance. He talks about their inheritance, verse 12 through 14. Then he talks about the invisible God, that Jesus Christ, or God is invisible, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So you can even say that because that's also with the eye. Image of the invisible God. Then we see importance, that in all things he might have the preeminence, where he is the firstborn from the dead. When people hear that, firstborn also, he was born. It doesn't mean, just because it says firstborn, it doesn't talk about the fact that he was, I mean, he was born, but that doesn't mean that's the beginning of his existence. The firstborn was a, the person, you know that you're fir firstborn in those days, that's the person that get the double portion. That's the person that, that was in the most important in that sense, that he got the, the, the double portion of, of the inheritance. And so the firstborn was somebody who had, the authority and was the important person. So that's when it talks about Jesus as being the firstborn, that he has all authority. Where was I? So you have importance. Then you have, you had intercession. You have the intercessor. And of course, that's Jesus. And then, the last part, verse 23 through 29, is to inform. He's basically saying that it is our job to inform people about Jesus. That's, that's how he ends the, the, the first chapter. Okay, so introduction. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the word of God. And then, of course, Paul... In, in most of his books, talks about him, he, he will say that he's an apostle because sometimes there are people that did not think of him as an apostle because he was a different apostle than the 12 apostles and that he, he came to Jesus the other way around than they did. So when they came to Christ and they seen the ministry of Jesus from his, the beginning of his public ministry, from his baptism, and all the way to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Whereas Apostle Paul, when he came to Christ, Jesus had already ascended. So he sees Jesus, and Jesus teaches him as in his resurrected body. So Jesus, in his resurrected body, teaches Paul, and so Paul gets all the information straight from the source. Because you could not be an apostle unless you got the message straight from the source. That's why he's an apostle. All the apostles, in fact, when they had to replace Judas Iscariot, they had to find someone that was there from Jesus' baptism to his ascension. And that way it was somebody that heard the message straight from Jesus' mouth. And Apostle Paul, he wasn't part of uh, the 12 apostles in that sense. In fact, some people believe, and I, I don't believe this necessarily, but some people believe that instead of Matthias, the, the 12th apostle that replaced Judas was supposed to be Apostle Paul. Some people believe that. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm not saying that I'm right, but I probably am. But, <laughs> but some people believe that he's supposed to be the one to replace them, not Matthias. But anyway, yeah, I don't, but we know that Apostle Paul is an apostle. Now, in the book of Philippians, they acknowledged him like that already. So he didn't say, he didn't insert that to the, to the church at Philippi. But to a lot of other churches, he does. Because some people did not consider him or think of him as an apostle, especially the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth really felt like he was second rate. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And if you remember in the book of, of Galatians, he, he gives his testimony and how that he was taught straight by Je He says, I did not go to the other apostles to learn. I was taught by Jesus Christ in Arabia. And that part in Arabia, meaning that it was probably by Mount Sinai in that area that he was taught by Jesus. And he talks about that in Galatians. 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. So saints, of course, that is all those that are saved. It means those that are set apart. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he says those words a lot and they mean a lot. Grace be unto you and peace. And when you, because of the grace of God, we have peace with God. And then we also have peace with each other, and then we have the peace that passeth all understanding. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these great attributes that we get simply because we've trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. So the next thing is intercession. And he says this, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. If you want to be thankful for someone, pray for them. If there's someone that you can't stand or someone that is just a thorn at your side, pray for them. I've seen August. Is August in here? Maybe stepped out. I, I thought I saw him. I remember when, when August was serving in Ram years ago, he would always say that if someone had a, a problem with somebody. He'd say, he always would say the same thing. Pray for them. Pray for them. They need your prayers. Because when you pray for someone, it's hard to be mad at them. So he says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Though he never met most of them, the Christians of Colossae were on Paul's prayer list. Imagine that. I mean, I don't know how long his prayer list was. But there is a lot of people that he prayed for. And, of course, he's in prison, and I guess you could say that he had a lot of time. But it's amazing that he will pray for people that he never, never even met. But these are people that he was concerned for because this is a church that was started by someone that he taught. So it has, uh, he has a lot of interest in this church. He was really, you could, you could feel his heart and his passion when uh, uh, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, you know, these, these churches that he, that he founded or, or started directly. But even this church, that he's, he, he's concerned enough about them to pray for them. Praying always for you. <clears throat> Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have, for, have to all the saints. That is normal, to have love for the brethren and the sisterin. <laughs> It is abnormal to not love the brethren. So when you get saved, just like when you're in a, your, your family, there may be people in your family that irritate you or maybe struggle to get along with them, but you still love them. And sometimes it's, there's some people that we love that we may not even like. You know what I'm saying? You love them, but you don't really like them. <laughs> Remember, there's a friend of mine, he would sometimes say to his wife, he'd say, I like you. <laughs> I'm like, how come you say that? He goes, because that's, because he says, I say I love you too, but he says sometimes you may love someone, but you just don't like them at that moment <laughs> because of Maybe you got into an argument with them. You, you unconditionally love them, but sometimes... So when you do like them, that's... That you're having a good day. <laughs> and of the love which ye have to all saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. They're going through a difficult time. So he's reminding them, hey, even though you go through a difficult time, just as he said in, in the book of Romans, that the sufferings of this present time is not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in, in us. That we're going to be in heaven one day, and all these things that we're going through now, is there, it's not going to matter. You may be going through some, some difficulties. You may be going through, through some physical issues or some financial struggles or some uh, uh, relational struggles or with your family or kids or, or parents or or neighbors even, <laughs> or with your pets. <laughs> Sometimes pets, they can do the craziest things. 
They do the things that hurt themselves, but they still do it. And then I'm thinking, maybe God lets us have pets so that as we see them do these things that hurt themselves, we're reminded of sometimes the things that we do to hurt ourselves and how God feels when he looks down upon us and thinking, why did you guys do that? Like this one dog that we have that will circle around a tree, man, and now he's like this. Oh. <laughs> and then when I try to get him around, he's fighting me. Anyway, or how about you have these dogs that, that will dump over their water? I mean, they'll actually look at you and dump over the water. I'm, like, I'm not going to put it back. And you're like, ha, oh, and they fill it up again. And then you leave, you drive off, and boom, they dump, dump the water again. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth, doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. When someone receives the Lord, it's going to produce fruit in their life. There's no way around it. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. And he's writing to them about their pastor, who is a fellow servant, a minister of Christ. That's all we should be too, right? Is ministers and is servants. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. The day that, they, that he heard about their faith, he did not cease to pray for them and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he prayed for them that they would, have, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. So if you want to know how Apostle Paul prayed for people, that's what he prayed for them for that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all, spirit, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then the, the next thing in verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Strength with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Sometimes it's helpful for us, that would, and it, would, it helps our prayer life when we Look at how the people in the Bible prayed. And then there's some practical things I wanted to kind of bring out today about prayer. You know, if you've ever thought sometimes it's just, man, my prayer life just, it's just a little stagnant. Well, here's a couple things that might help you in your prayer life. Well, we know our Apostle Paul, he prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and that they would walk worthy of the Lord and that they would be pleasing to him, that they would be fruitful that they would increase in their knowledge of God, that they would be strength with all might according to his glorious power under all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. So that's a, something that you can, we can add to our prayer life. Some things that you might want to consider in your prayer life to kind of spruce it up. Pray the Ten Commandments. That's one thing that... that we can do commandment number one to, to, to not have any gods before our god say lord i put you first in my life help me not to have any other interest before you that nothing would excite me more than you do that we would not have any graven image help me lord not to worship something and think it's more important than you, because it could be even like a car or, you know, some material possession. Help me not to take the name of, of the Lord in vain. Help me, Lord, not to take your, your name in vain. And, you know, sometimes with these, you know, these, what, these, uh, what are those called, acronyms or, you know, when you text, you have, 
Well, there's some of them that are not good to say. And sometimes Christians will say these ones. You know the ones I'm talking about, right? And, and I've heard somebody say, well, when I say it, mine doesn't mean the Lord's name. It means something else. I said, but to everybody else it does. So when they're saying it, they're reading it that way, and that's not a good idea. The Bible says not to take the name of the Lord in vain. But not only that, when I profess the name of Jesus, if, if I'm not a good testimony, I can, in a sense, be taking his name in vain. Help me, Lord, not to make you look bad. And we can pray, pray the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath means rest or cessation. And Jesus, he, Jesus is our Sabbath. When people say that, you guys don't keep the Sabbath because we don't have church on Saturday. <laughs> By the way, you can have church on any day. But it's not about, in, under the, the new covenant, it's not about a day. It's not about a place. It's not about the temple. Or right now, a temple mount. <laughs> People will pray at the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. It's not about a place. It's not about a day. It's about a person, and his name is Jesus. So when we remember the, the Sabbath day to keep it holy, we can, we can say, <clears throat> Lord, help me to get to know you better because everything is about my relationship with Jesus. Honor your father and your mother. Lord, help me to honor my father and mother and all those that have uh, authority over me. And we can also pray for our leaders and pray for the, the pastoral staff or your spiritual leader, those that's taking you under their, their wing and discipling you. Thou shalt not murder. Help me, Lord, not to look down upon people or to talk about people or help me not to, because murder, as Jesus said, is not just when you kill someone. You can even hate them, and, and it, he says that you're guilty of murder. Help me not to commit adultery. Help me not to lust. Help me not to steal. Help me not to steal the time from the, the, my company. Or help me not to, to uh, rob God. And help me, Lord, to be generous with my time and my talents and my treasures. Commandment number nine, not to bear false witness against your neighbor. Help me love my neighbor as myself. Help me not to covet. Help me to be content with what, what I have. So that's a way to... To pray. Pray the Ten Commandments. You can also pray the Our Father. Our Father who, you know, they say it's the Lord's Prayer, but really it's a, it's a model prayer. Because we know Jesus never prayed this for himself. Because it talks about forgiving those who trespass against, or uh, forgive us our trespasses and he never sinned. So. Our Father who art in heaven. We could say to the Lord, Lord, our Father who is in heaven, you are uh, great and mighty and awesome. To, and hallowed be thy name, you are holy. Pray thy kingdom come, that, that, that thy will will be done. Lord, I pray that your will would be done in my life. On this earth as it is in heaven, help me to do your will. Give us this day our daily bread, meet our needs. And forgive us our trespasses, and we can ask for forgiveness. And also that we forgive those who trespass against us to, to where we don't have any grudges. Lead us not into temptation. Help me to stay away from the areas and places and people that is going to cause me to fall. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. It all belongs to you. And power and the glory that you would receive the glory and honor in my life. That my life would, be a, 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 that my life would honor and glorify you. Then there's also a, a way to pray with your, you ever heard the, the, the fingers, the hands? There's different ways that you can do this, like the um, pointer fingers pointing up to, to the Lord and um, praising and worshiping the Lord. And then your middle finger, you can pray for, you know, the, um, your sins and confess your sins. This is uh, the ring finger, of course, on my right hand, but... All those that you have relation that that your family and friends and those that are your relatives, and then this uh, um, pinky finger is it's your littlest finger, it's your weakest finger. Help me, Lord, with uh, my weaknesses. Strengthen me. Help me, Lord, to live the Christian life through your power. And then the thumb is thumbs up. Like this is where we can thank the Lord for all things. You can just go through your 
You know, that could be a way to pray. And if you've ever heard this one, praying through the tabernacle, you know, the gates, enters gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So you're praying, if you picture the tabernacle, as you enter in it, that's how your prayer life is. You enter in with, enter his gates with, with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And when you come into the tabernacle, the first thing you come to is the, the, the brass altar. And that's, of course, where the sacrifice went. And so you could thank the Lord for, for your salvation. And it could be a time of confession or, or, or a time of uh, you know, just thanking the Lord for what he's done. Or a time of repentance, rather. And then when you, the next thing you, when you walk into the court, or when you enter into the, the tabernacle, you come across the brazen altar, then it's the laver after that. And the laver, it was like a mirror. And that's where the priests would, would, they would wash their, you know, their, their, their feet and their hands, and they would they'd cleanse themselves. And every time they pass the laver, they'd do that. So that's a time of confession. We confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Then when you go into the holy place, there's three articles of furniture in the holy place you walk in there and on the right side is the table of showbread and you can you can pray lord help me to provide a teaching and a a nourishment for the world because it's the bread the table of showbread and then on the left is the menorah the candlestick and lord help me to teach others your word and then right in the before you enter into the holy of holies you have the the, um, t- uh, you have the altar of incense, which pictures prayer of intercession. And you can pray for others and the needs of others. And then when you would go into the Holy of Holies, when you walk into that place, you see the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark, you had Aaron's um, rod that budded. And you could thank the, the Lord for his leadership, and you can even thank the leaders that he's put over us and pray for them. You can think about the the pot of manna, and of course that the manna typifies Jesus Christ. You can thank the Lord for all he's done and for him being the bread of life, and that uh, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then also you have the... the, um, the Ten Commandments. And then, of course, that's even, you can pray for the, about through the Ten Commandments or thank God for his word. And then the whole thing in the Holy of Holies is our relationship with the Lord himself. And we can, you know, pray that way to kind of spice up our prayer life. And so when you think about Apostle Paul and his life, a lot of what he did was pray. And I think that's why he was so successful. You know, when I was studying this, uh, this book, I, was, uh, I think it was the book of James. And in the book of James, it was one of the verses that says, you, you fight in war, but you have not because you ask not. Like in chapter 3, it ended with peace, talking about peace. And in chapter 4, it right away starts talking about war, conflict and war and fightings among you. And he says, you have all these fightings and war. You lost and you have not. And you desire to have and cannot obtain, but you fight in war, but you have not because you simply, what, ask not. And then when you do ask, you ask amiss, then you may con- consume it upon your own lust. Because here one day you ask the Lord to give you a, a, a good um, woman in your life, and then now you're praying and asking God to give you this particular woman that's not the one he wants for you. And, you, and then we're saying, why, does not, why did, didn't God give me what I asked for? Because you asked for a good person over here and now you ask for you know this particular person and it's a con- it's a contradiction <laughs> and so the lord is trying to answer this prayer so even though we don't always know what's going on he does and so we should pray lord whatever your will is we pray that your will will be done so he says that you have not simply because you ask not or when you do ask you ask that you you would have just what you want and that's not what the Lord is trying to do, to just give us what we want. Because sometimes what we want is the worst thing for us. But he's trying to give us the things that is good for us, like any parent would want to do. And so, but what the idea is that you struggle because you simply don't pray. There was uh, two 
these uh, two wives, both of them, their husbands were ministers. And one of the wives was saying, man, my husband, he's really struggling in the ministry. I mean, he is having a hard time. And he's having this issue, this problem, this issue, this problem. He's really struggling. He's really having a hard time. And they both were mending their husband's uh, pants. They were sewing it. And they were talking. And then the other woman was saying, well, my husband is in the ministry too, but he's having it. He's really enjoying it. And things are going well. And, and he's really just, uh, you know, really having a great time as a minister. The part of the pants that they were mending the wife where, whose husband things are going really bad was the, the seat part of his pants she was mending. The other pastor's, the other wife was, was mending the knee area of his pants. One of them was wearing out the knees. One of them was wearing out the seat. One of them was just sitting around complaining, and the other one was praying about everything. And that's the difference sometimes in our life where we could be struggling and stressing and having problem after problem after problem. And God, he's simply just saying to us, just pray about it. That everything you're trying to do and accomplish, I want to do that for you, but you have to ask. You have not because you ask not. So we see that in, a, in a Apostle Paul's life. Intercession that he prayed for the church. The church was going through struggles. The church was having problems. But Paul was saying, but I'm praying for you. So we see the intercession. So introduction, intercession, and then the next thing is inheritance. And then we'll continue on through the chapter. But we'll have to stop there. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. The first thing is most important. The first thing is, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior?